Hello Avatar fans and welcome to the next episode of the Avatar Online Podcast. This is going to be episode 218 of our regular shows and we are recording this on September the 6th, 2020. This is the official podcast for the fan site AvatarTheLastAirbenderOnline.com and I'm going to be your main host, Morgan Airspeed Prime. Also joining me on the podcast is Greg, Greg Tooby. What's up everyone? Excellent. So... We have uh, some news to cover as well as uh, finishing up our big uh, three-part review for The Shadow of Kyoshi. So we're going to be doing the final third of the book here. Uh, But first, we have a few pieces of news to cover. So the first one um, that kind of links together with the second one is all about we're waiting for Korra comic news. So the fandom is sort of jumping on anything that they say. And this came from the Dark Horse live stream that they do every uh, Wednesday. Usually it's to show off new books, but they they mention a few things. They hint at some stuff. And not this past Wednesday, but the one before, uh, people caught on that uh, Kara O'Neill, who's like the social media manager for Dark Horse, said uh, this, and it was quoted. It's been spread around a lot. We'll be making a big announcement very soon. But join us next week here on Twitch, same time, same place, like I said, about 1pm Pacific, for something new and exciting in the Legend of Korra universe. We are once again partnering with Nickelodeon to bring you some fun stuff, so our streams in the next two weeks will have some big guests and fun and exciting giveaways. So return, join us again in the future, future Wednesdays. So this, obviously, prior to this past Wednesday, everyone was thinking, are they finally doing what we want them to do? Like making a big announcement on a stream getting people in and this is it this has to be it the big Cora announcement Cora comics it turned out to not be the case but I, I suppose before we get into what actually happened Greg what what are your thoughts on on this quote uh, this way to sort of tease something uh, that they put out yeah I mean it's it definitely got everyone riled up for sure I think um you know, there's a lot of different speculation with what was going to come up and, you know, possible stories. And I don't know, I think, I don't know, I thought it was cool in general. Um, I think maybe it might have been a bit too much for what really was the case. Um, but yeah, I mean, the whole idea of, you know, the comics coming up soon or, you know, something that we've been waiting on for so long, then that's just sort of what immediately everyone sort of thought compared to what has happened so far, at least. Mm, yeah, and I think the problem especially was that if you watch that stream in or around when they say that, they also do like mention the, the live uh, readings. So because they had mentioned that like elsewhere and that they hope to do more, no one really connected that when they were talking about announcements that what was going to be next week was going to be another live reading because <laughs> they talked about it so casually just before. But that's what ended up actually happening. Uh, I think it was just the day before, like Tuesday before the stream, they did announce that, oh, third Turf Wars uh, live reading is going to happen. Nothing, no mention about news or anything like that, just this is what it's going to be. Uh, so that happened. Uh, it was kind of a weird one for me because I, I watched the whole thing and they went relatively long on it. I think it's like an hour, 10 minutes, whereas usually it's under an hour. And the live reading itself only took about five minutes because the way they split up the book across the three streams was not particularly well organized because they did like, I think, 20 something pages in the first one. They basically did like 40 pages in the second one, and they only left themselves about 16 pages here for the last one. And most of this was um, action scenes. So like half of it was just the voice actors doing like sound effects from the comic. There's like barely any dialogue in the last bunch of pages from Turf Wars. And yeah, they, they got through it within like the first five minutes of the stream. And it was meant to be a QA, and a and they, they asked a few questions. But like the last one, it was basically just, you know, you know, how, <laughs> how how's lockdown going for you voice actors? And it was just, you know, talking about this, that and the other. Like, I think there was like one or two Avatar specific questions. Uh, there was a lot of people in the chat being like, that's it like you're, you're not going to do any of turf wars part two here even though it's you, what you did was so short um Kara O'Neill did roughly hint at the idea that there is like some sort of news coming it was nowhere near the quote from before that we just read out but it was it was something along the lines of 
um like there 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 is going to be more core comics that like when there's news like you'll hear about it you'll know about it that like it'll be big when it happens um but nothing as concrete as they seemingly said before so they definitely communicated quite poorly about the big thing that is uh, new and exciting in the Legend of Korra universe being the last part of the Turf Wars live reading. That that doesn't fit for me. Uh, but I, I guess at the very least we know that there is something coming. It's just we're back to sort of square one and not having any idea of where it is. But what, what were your thoughts on the uh, final Turf Wars part one live reading? Uh, yeah, the reading was was fine. I think it's always cool to see them, you know, how they actually do it and just sort of how it how it plays out together. Um, it was quite short, like you said, and it was overall. I didn't watch the whole thing, but I watched all of the reading. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think it's it's interesting how they're always sort of mentioning how there's more stuff coming, but it's not really. I don't know. They're never quite ever really ready um, to you know say what's really happening um until they really are so all these sort of early teases i mean it's nice it gets people sort of going but then like you said we're just sort of back to where we were before where we're just sort of waiting i mean it does seem now more so that is closer to actually happening um it seems like you know it's nice to know that it seems like things are actually like progressing along um but i wonder if it's you know i always wonder how you know how early they're saying stuff, you know, does it really, you know, how soon does it actually mean that we're actually going to get anything? Is it actually worth us even knowing, you know, as much as we do know, which isn't that much? Yeah, because um, everyone still is agrees. Like, it's not just a few fans blowing this out of proportion. Like, it definitely seems like they know that there's something they have that they're waiting to show. And we've known that since March, since the Rachel Roberts interview, where she said that, like, there's new stuff coming for both Avatar and Korra, uh, different formats and approaches and stuff like that. That quote is stuck in my mind and the fact that they have basically, without being super clear about it, said that there are more Korra comics coming. We just don't have any of the details. Um, which again sort of links into our final piece of news here and that is that um, we got the preview pages for the Runes of the Empire Library Edition, which is actually out next week in comic book stores, um, and then like two weeks afterwards in uh, just uh, everywhere basically. Um, and one of the preview pages that we got is the foreword to the book. So obviously they do the Korra Library Edition slightly differently than the Avatar ones. So instead of doing annotations, they just have like a foreword, and then we have to wait and see what the art section at the back is like. But the foreword this time is by Michelle Wong, who's the artist on Runes of the Empire. And it definitely reads like I did art on a Korra comic. I've marked it off the book at list. Uh, thanks to everyone for having me on this book. And that's it. And it says uh, signed like April 2020 when she wrote this. So like, if there's an announcement coming soon, you would think that the book was already in the planning back in April. Um, but it, it has been a while since April at the same time. Um, it, I suppose if they announce a book, it's an, it's a core book. It, it's not going to be out until like, I suppose like first or second quarter of 2021. So there's definitely time for them to have announced something, but it, it doesn't really feel like she's talking about it as if like a, a second book was immediately on the cards or even if she was potentially offered one, that she's maybe okay with it, okay with only being on one. Uh, what's your take on this? Do you think it's we should read into the foreword at all? I don't know. It's it's a tough one because it it was done you know quite a while ago, um, and you know a lot of things have changed since then. I mean, I do you know sort of you know get sort of the same feeling as it sort of being like sort of like. The capstone type of project for doing something in this universe um just with all of the sort of like thanks and whatnot throughout the whole sort of forward but that could just be you know sort of like your standard fare of you know gratitude and whatnot um so i don't know how far you know we really should read into it as far as you know thinking that um she's not coming back for you know future books um i mean i i hope she does um you know i definitely 
like the art style and everything that's come out of uh, you know this particular series of books. So I definitely would be down for more work from Michelle Wong. Um, but I guess we'll have to wait and see when they're going to actually, you know, give us some actual details on what's really coming rather than just sort of these mini teases. Yeah, uh, I, I've seen nothing but praise for Michelle Wong as well. I haven't seen anyone really criticizing the art. Like most people are like, this is what core comic art like should have been. And I, I haven't seen any hate towards her at all. So um, I guess if she's not interested in doing more, it's probably down to whatever schedule there is for doing it, uh, which is fair enough. But that might explain why there's been quite a delay since the last core comic because they have to find another artist again um, and, and and that just seems to be the, the case in general that when we get an art transition that's when things really slow down so I don't know it, it, it's hard because we, we have no information whatsoever we I, I suppose on the the stream the, the Turf Wars live reading Cara O'Neill did say that like um, Mike is like heavily involved in the comics and I don't know if that's just that, like, oh, he wrote the two core comics so far, or she was saying that, like, oh, I know what the announcement coming up is, and that Mike's on it as well. Um, it, it's hard to speculate, but yeah, just the fact that we... Usually there's sort of a little bit of a sort of rumor mill just from the people involved and what they're maybe teasing or posting on social media. We're not really getting any of that here, but... Um, with uh, Mike and Brian not on the live action show anymore, it it leaves them open to be more heavily involved in this. Like they said, they're going to be committed to Avatar going forward. Um, but yeah, like I said, uh, Runes of the Empire Library Edition is out next week in comic book stores, and then uh, two weeks after that in regular bookstores and uh, online and everywhere. And uh, after that, uh, it's pretty much just over a month until the Katara comic comes out so we'll finally get our first look at one of these uh, one-shot books uh, and we'll see how exactly that works out but uh, yeah uh, not a ton of news on the horizon apart from whenever they announce the next core comic which I think is kind of needed at this point but we'll move from news into the main topic for this show and that is going to be uh, finishing up our review for The Shadow of Kyoshi. So we've done the first two-thirds of the book. Uh, where we stopped was um, at the end of the chapter called The Edge, which was basically that we left off with uh, Korra having went off to kidnap uh, Lady Huazo and Shijin. So I think she, she has Huazo at this point, which is where we're going to open up uh, with the chapter called uh, The Companion. And uh, just for anyone wondering, the chapters we're going to be covering here to the end of the book are The Companion, uh, The Edge, uh, Shapes of Life and Death, uh, House Cleaning, uh, Second Chances, Lost Friends, Interlude, The Man from the Spirit World, Home Again, The Meeting, and Epilogue. So, uh, The Companion is basically Kyoshi getting to interact uh, one-on-one with Huazo here. And the core of this chapter is her basically revealing what happened to her in the past. That we know she had this relationship with uh, Fire Lord Cheryu. And here we find out the details that, you know, they were in love as teenagers. But the the ministers that were sort of uh, advising him were basically like, she's not from a good clan at this point in time. We want the Kyoso clan to be the, the one connected to the, the royal line. So uh, please like basically break off your relationship with Huazo and they introduce him to Lady Sulan and basically give him the option to accept this arranged marriage, leave the relationship behind, nothing bad will happen. And she just notes that this was like the worst day of her life. It was almost staged like an assassination, the way, way it happened. There was so much underhandedness going on. And the one thing that she sort of had to, in a way, like get back at him for this is that she was pregnant. So she was able to sort of reveal that publicly. And that's why Chair Yu had to acknowledge Chaijin because everyone knew that he was in this relationship and he had to accept it because of when she revealed it. Um, and uh, there's just a bit of a back and forth here about like Kiyoshi, about like figuring out Huazo's motivations. Like, is she just doing this as like, revenge for what happened in the past or is she really wanting to be the leader and the 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 question this is where they get into the sort of nuance of like 
is it just this petty grab for power or is there like she would be a better leader it w- would uh Chajin with her behind him be a better leader than Zoryu and Kyoshi's sort of thinking that that she's much more politically savvy than anyone she's met if she was the fire lady to uh uh Cheryu in the past things might have turned out a little bit differently but uh, what what are your thoughts on this uh, kind of backstory here from Huazo I really enjoyed um hearing this backstory I think this was definitely well told um from you know Lady Huazo um the whole way that she went back and forth with, you know, sort of like her, her romance to begin with and just sort of how, you know, eventually just turned sour um, just because of, you know, the, the pressures of the core and the politics and everything like that. I mean, it's, you know, it's interesting to see, you know, Kiyoshi's thoughts throughout this whole conversation, how, you know, she could see herself actually, you know, getting along with her if it wasn't for their sort of current circumstances. Um, even Jinpai, you know, at the end, you know, the very end acts, he's like, no, like, are you friends now? And she's like, no, of course. But, you know, you could see how, you know, she might actually be someone that Kyoshi could, you know, confide in or just sort of, you know, someone that could lead her, you know, some of the more, you know, delicate proceedings that the court, you know, has going on, especially in the Fire Nation with, you know, the honor and the Agni Kais and, you know, everything that's wrapped up in it. Um, I think, you know, this chapter specifically gives her, um, gives Kyoshi a lot to think about here. Um, so I really like that sort of, you know, back and forth that they have, you know, during this. I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, she is a, a captive, um, you know, she's being taken away, um, even though, you know, at this point she's pretty, you know, um, confident that nothing's going to, like, hurt her or anything like that. Um, but, you know, she is still, you know, being taken somewhere that she doesn't really know for some end that, you know, she probably has a, a inkling of what's actually happening, but she, you know, doesn't really know what's going to happen at the end of uh, this trip that they're on right now. So no, I thought this was definitely a, a cool chapter. I think the history part sort of like flashbacks that we get, especially in the later half of this book, I think are, are really cool to see, you know, when everything, you know, finally comes together. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just like uh, the meddling that the Fire Nation do, and it's especially when they mention that like the, the Seinaka clan was like heavily involved in what happened in the past with Huazo, uh-huh. that informs like a lot of why she's so eager to say like, oh, like your, your beloved Seinaka women, are, they, they would do this sort of stuff as well, because from her perspective, they have in the past that all of the clans sort of are involved in this to a... A certain degree and like how differently things would be if they didn't have these like weird views of like politicking to get one clan into power over the other it's um pretty interesting stuff but uh yeah she drops her off at uh, one of uh john Ju's properties that he has at um in the fire nation and she's just like you're just gonna leave me here and kiyoshi's like where are you gonna go like you're so far away from the capital it's easier for you to stay here um, so at this point, Kyoshi and Jimpa have a little bit of a discussion here with basically the idea being that this is Kyoshi going to extremes, kidnapping someone and she's going off to get Jin now. Um, if she gets this wrong, it's going to look terribly. And she's kind of like, Jimpa, you're an air nomad. Why are you continuing to involve yourself with me, even though I'm going to such extremes? And he just notes that, like, I'm an air nomad, but I'm also part of my organization. And so we have the further teasing. They still don't say it. They don't say White Lotus, but it's definitely White Lotus. Um, And that there's this conflict within him of, like, yes, if he was just an air nomad, he probably wouldn't want to be involved. But the White Lotus does have views on things where, like, yes, even if you're going down a path like this, if it's important for the fate of the world, then yes, he should get involved. And so that's why he's he's going to help Kyoshi throughout all of this. And uh, I, I like giving that nuance to Jimpa that, oh yeah, the, the White Lotus, we usually view it as being this entirely good group, but for them to affect any change, they're going to have to 
circumnavigate some of the rules, I suppose. And this is showing Jimpa willing to do that. Um, so, so what are your thoughts on on what they do here with Jimpa here? This discussion between him and Kyoshi. Yeah, this is very, it's a very good one to get, you know, it has a lot of, I guess, sort of nuance to it, just sort of the whole idea that they bring up of, you know, the philosophies of beauty and truth and how does that actually play into world affairs and, you know, how, you know, sometimes you have to put some of your, you know, your principles, your morals to sort of the, the background if you're trying to make any change or that's what they're going for in this sort of discussion here because you know Kyoshi she's pretty you can tell that she's you no know, she's willing to go through you no know, these extremes like that's sort of her core character but the the way that you know uh, Jinpa was raised and just sort of the the idea of air nomads especially just sort of how the world views them in general this is you know, pretty much in conflict of everything that he's probably grown up with. So it's interesting to see how this is playing out, you know, how, you know, both of them are feeling, you know, pretty compromised at this point and how, you know, it's going to affect them later on. So, you know, having this, you know, another sort of heart to heart conversation here where, you know, Kyoshi, she's, you know, she's realizing the extremes that she's going through and she's, you know, trying to see, you know, somehow in the future she can, you know, just be better than Jim, better to Jimpa in, um, in general. Cause she, you know, she, she realized in a lot of the sort of stress and, you know, just the turmoil that she's putting on him particularly. Mm -hmm. And next chapter is called the edge and we get a quick return of Kyoshi to the capital because, of course, Cheijin is obviously involved in the core politics, so she's going to get Cheijin by going there. She informs Zoryu what she's been up to, and it's basically just this thing of, like, they're now both in this together. Kyoshi making this move has involved Zoryu, even if she's made it herself, and he realizes it too, that if this goes wrong, I'm done as Fire Lord, so he is going to support her on this because she's made this move but he knows that this could go very very badly so uh, Zoryu has basically his guards have Cheijin brought to Kyoshi and then basically after this it's just uh, Kyoshi brings Cheijin back to where Huazo is and just threatens both of them by basically threatening them threatening to drop both of them off the side of a cliff it's a pretty crazy situation where like she's controlling the the earth bending of like the foundations of the house as she's holding like Cheijin off of uh, um <coughs> off of Jimpa's bison and in this moment she this is her at her most extreme like threatening to kill two people here a uh, mother and son and they're both not saying anything. She wants them to admit it. And if they're going to admit that they were involved with Yoon, this is where they're going to break down. But neither of them do. And especially when she gets sort of, you know, contacted at this moment by uh, Karuk, saying, like, this isn't who you are. She realizes that she's completely wrong. She's, she's completely miscalculated this. It seemed like Yoon was involved with the Sao clan, but... They're not. They they honestly have not had any involvement with Yoon. And so, like was just said at the start of the chapter, Zoryu and Kyoshi are just... They've basically caused a war in the Fire Nation as far as they're both concerned here. And like ending the chapter with the line, not only was she the loser of the game, it had been a mistake for her to ever play. So, uh, very much an, an Azula Long Feng style li line there, but even worse because Long Fang at least knew sort of how to play the game to a degree. Kyoshi just like, yeah, I shouldn't have been involved at all. Um, so this is a really surprising moment in the book where it's just like, wow, Kyoshi's just made a huge blunder here. And so she's forced to basically leave the two of them there, make her own way back to the capital with the idea being that by the time they make their way back to the capital, war is going to happen. So uh, what are your thoughts on this chapter? Yeah, no, this is definitely uh, the farthest extremes that we've seen Kyoshi go, you know, thus far, at least as far as, like, actually putting people directly into harm's way here. And, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, in theory, her, her whole idea, her whole plot, you know, it has, you know, some credibility. There is, you know, some evidence, even if it's, like, conjecturally 
um, that, you know, they're behind this, that they're working with Yoon, that, you know, this is something that could actually be true. But clearly here, um, you know, either just because of the circumstances or maybe because of how Yoon actually, you know, set things up, um, she's definitely not looking at the right people for, you know, the cause of the, you know, the issues that are happening here. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely, you know, to see her go through this, to see her try this and then just to see her fail so hard at it, um, you know, it's, it's quite unfortunate the way that, you know, she has to go through all this pain, which seems to be just a, a reoccurring thing in, you know, her life specifically up until this point. So it's a, a sad thing to see. And yeah, just is pretty, it's pretty, you know, shocking just to see how it goes down. Mm, yeah. And, and this is obviously going to be this big thing that informs why she takes such an approach going forward as the Avatar, that she going forward is not going to involve herself in the petty politics of nations when she sees something go wrong she's going to make a move to fix it straight away without getting entwined with anyone or supporting one side over the other because uh, as mm -hmm. we'll see in the coming chapters things change quite drastically but um yeah um really interesting at the start of the next chapter uh, shapes of life and death it did just note that like kiyoshi has to be brought back to her room by jimpa like that she's just like gone at this point like she's made such a bad mistake she's so down in confidence that she is just utterly drained because she knows that she's basically caused a war that there's going to be so much bad stuff that happens in the fire nation pretty much because of her actions but suddenly she's called to a big meeting there's an assembly that she needs to be there for and zoryu gives a big speech so this is kind of what we've been waiting for like the entire book like Zoryu has done nothing as the Fire Lord he's his character has basically been that he's been this uh, this Fire Lord who hasn't been able to do anything because the um, the spirits in a way have been against him uh, bad crops bad fishing bad weather stuff like that stuff that he can't affect working against him but he's been not he's not been able to make any positive move to change things and has not reacted at all to any of the bad stuff that's happened in the book but here he is finally in control and he gives this speech and he notes that um let it be known that the spirits of the islands have been watching my reign since its inception judging my fitness to be fire lord with the attack upon the palace they've put me to the final test and i have passed it i found the perpetrator bring him out please and so this it basically the guards bring out Yoon and Yoon confesses to everything. I infiltrated the palace. I assaulted the members of the court. I vandalized the royal gallery. I killed Chancellor Dairin. And I did it all at the behest of the Sawan clan. So this is an interesting one given what just happened and that like we know straight away that this is a lie because Kyoshi interrogated um Huazo and Cheijin and they definitely weren't involved. So what's happened here and so as they quickly take this Yoon off stage Kyoshi follows them because she she doesn't believe that Zoryu has been able to capture Yoon given how powerful he is so she takes out his guards behind the scenes and finds out that this Yoon is actually a fake imposter Yoon and it's actually this sort of political decoy that was prepared like a while ago by Janju and Yoon for visits to the Fire Nation to avoid like assassinations and so on. But um yeah, this this guy, the fake Yoon, is like stop trying to save me, you'll ruin everything because his deal is that he's going to be killed to sort of protect the Fire Nation. He'll be protecting his family and that Zoryu is going to like make sure his family are kind of well off going forward, I suppose, better. But he will die to sort of keep peace in the fire nation here because this fake confession here that the Sawan clan is responsible solves like every single problem pretty much at play here so Zoryu makes his one move and has completely won the day meaning that technically Kyoshi's side has won but she knows that like innocent people have to be sacrificed for this because like immediately we see that everyone turns on the Sawan clan upon hearing that they're apparently traitors to their nation so 
lots of Sawan clan members are going to die and this fake Yoon is also going to have to die. And, you know, the the chapter ends with just Kyoshi screaming into the darkness because she's helpless in this situation. Zoryu has, like, now also sort of outplayed her as well. So I, I really like this chapter, just a sudden turn. Zoryu, you suddenly see that sense of, like, ah, this is where that evil line of Fire Lord sort of comes from to a certain degree. This is ruthless action from him finally making his move. But uh, what were your thoughts on this chapter? Yeah, he, he definitely makes his move at this point. And yeah, I think that is a, a thing. It's like, is this where, I mean, I don't know, I think it's, it's probably sort of more ingrained in, um, you know, Fire Nation history and culture as far as sort of like the ruthlessness or, you know, the direct, you know, swift action that you take once you, you know, figure out your your course of action, your purpose. Um, so that's, you know, kind of feels like that's part of, like, ingrained in the Fire Nation in general. Not that there isn't, you know, kindness and, you know, all of that in it um, as well. But here for sure, I mean, um, you know, he finally, you know, gets the has a plan as far as, you know, how he's going to, how Zoryu is going to sort of save his nation, you know, the fact that they have, you know, this fake Yoon prepared um, ahead of time just because of, you know, you know, how, I guess, sort of, I guess you can see in this case, how handy that actually comes in and just, you know, Kyoshi's just sort of like, just, you know, completely distraught with how, you know, she already messed up once, but now she's going to like, let this, you know, also happen just to sort of like, save face for the nation is, you know, it's almost too much for her to bear. And, you know, you can see how she comes to deal with this or attempts to deal with this in the coming chapters. But just to have this sort of come out of nowhere where she was like, you know, so beside herself, you know, just even getting back to the palace or barely even being able to get back to the palace to have to sort of deal with this. I mean, you know, she's still able to sort of like have a commanding sort of like presence, like the fact that she's able to sort of like take down all of these guards that are, you know, protecting or, you know, capturing or holding uh, hostage the the fake Yoon. You can see, you know, her ability to sort of, you know, wield the elements and her sort of like overwhelming strength that they mentioned here. Um, you know, that's still in full force, but she's, you know, she's definitely having a lot of inside, you know, turmoil with just, you know, more and more just problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, next chapter is house cleaning. So Kyoshi goes to confront Zoryu after everything calms down and they just have a talk but a really interesting note here right at the start that shows the the change in Zoryu just with one action is that Kiyoshi demands that an artist is in the room uh, painting Zoryu and Kiyoshi tells the artist to leave but the artist waits until Zoryu confirms the dismissal that would not have happened with Zoryu in like any of the other chapters but now that the people have seen Zoryu make a big move, be a leader, be commanding and decisive. Suddenly he is the Fire Lord to, to be looked up to. And that's a big change of things because usually everyone is like, you know, Kyoshi's this giant character who wears her armor and like makeup everywhere. They listen to what she says, but now she's not being listened to. So it's a big role reversal between these two. But they just discussed uh, quickly discussed the double where it came from that it came from Janju and Yoon coming up with the plan. But then it gets to the idea of okay, Zoryu, what's your plan now? And he just flat out says to her that his plan is to have the entirety of the Sawan clan basically wiped out. Everyone here in court is going to get captured and eventually executed. And then he plans to basically lay siege to Ma'inka Island to take out the rest of them. Uh, that's what he wants to do now, to make sure he is the one in charge. Um, Kyoshi brings up the, the valid point here, but like, what if the real Yoon turns up again? Your plan will be revealed to be a complete fake. But this is where he turns the tables on her again and has locked her into this situation and says, that's up to you. That he gives Kyoshi this option of like, kill Yoon and make this plan succeed and bring peace to the Fire Nation or don't kill Yoon and a war is going to happen. So this is another thing that doubles down on the fact that Kyoshi has to confront Yoon. She already has her sort of personal reasons for perhaps not wanting to, 
But now there's this deeper reason behind it in that Yoon being gone is kind of important for some sense of peace in the Fire Nation, even if it's like peace achieved in a way she's not particularly happy with. Um, but yes, uh, she, she, she tries to argue here, basically create the deal that, okay, I'll go after Yoon, but I don't want anyone killed. And there's this sort of reluctant agreement to it, um, but he kind of has to accept it. So it's sort of like unspoken that like we think we have a deal, but not really. Uh, there's another bit that happens later on, which we'll get to. But just uh, what are your thoughts on this first section of their conversation back and forth? Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, Zoru now, he's finally, you know, trying to be a leader. He, you know, is doing what he thinks is right for his nation, um, and he's roping Kiyoshi into it. I mean, it's almost sort of like they both sort of, like, roped each other into the situation because, you know, she started this with the whole idea of, you know, Yoon being behind everything, and then, of course, it turns out that that's not true, but he's able to sort of, you know, keep the farce up, um, but it's still, you know, everything still hangs on you, you know, not being in the picture. Um, because, you know, if he's still there, then clearly, you know, the person that they have is someone else. So, I don't know, it's, it's interesting to see how they're, you know, sort of going back and forth with this whole situation here. And, you know, sort of, you know, the demands on both sides to, you know, keep the peace, not keep the peace. What's the best way to keep the peace? Um, it's kind of, you know complicated with how it's actually going to go down and then especially with how it ends up in the end. Mm -hmm. So I think the important thing here going into the second part of this is that Zoryu doesn't really accept to this deal just because he's sort of intimidated by Kiyoshi because he sort of comes back at her here and turns the tables of like okay you have to go confront Yoon but a piece of advice before you do is that like you don't understand his feelings so Zoryu is going to be the one to really go at Kiyoshi about her reluctance about confronting him and how she feels about him. Um, he just says that uh, Yoon hates us. Everything he's done so far is because he hates us. You, me, the lieutenant. Um, and Kiyoshi says, that's not true. We were his friends. He's been acting out of vengeance. He said so. And Zoryu replies and says, I don't think he realizes it himself. Consider his deeds, Kiyoshi, not his words. Who has he been causing the most pain? For starters, me. By my reckoning, he's angry at me for daring to rule my country without his help. He's also furious with the lieutenant for having her mother's unconditional love when Janju, uh, what Janju gave him wasn't anything of the sort. And then there's you, Kiyoshi. Yoon has never been able to let go of the fact he's not the Avatar. To this day, he agonizes over what should have been. He grieves for his lost destiny and that grief has turned into blame. Janju and the others might have lied about his avatar hood, Kyoshi, but the uh, but only one person truly stole it from him, you. And so, pretty much for the first time in the entire book, this simple point finally is made and like addressed that he's not said it and he's held back from it and he hasn't properly come after Kyoshi, but it's because he himself is sort of conflicted about the idea himself. But deep down, the root cause of his anger is ultimately that he's not the Avatar because Kiyoshi is. And that finally has to hit her at this point. And he just notes that uh, it's not because he's played him a pie show that he knows this about Yoon, but it's because he's not blinded by the past like the two of you are. Um, maybe he's, he truly is possessed by a spirit. It doesn't change what needs to be done. And he dismisses her at this point, uh, highlighting again how in control he is now. But um, I really like that discussion between the two of them about Yoon because, again, Zoryu knows Yoon because Yoon has visited the Fire Nation before he, when he was thought to be the Avatar. But uh, what are your thoughts on the, the second half of this conversation? Yeah, I think it's it's probably because they're not, you know, close enough that he has, you know, such a, a strong connection with you and that he can sort of, you know, see past. I mean, you know, they're, I, I don't know, he seems to be like, you know, he mentions earlier on that, you know, they are friends, that they are, you know, acquaintances of a sort, but it's not, you know, it's not someone who grew up with you like Kyoshi and Rangi. So he's able to sort of step back and to see, you know, from a different perspective, what might truly be 
the cause of his turmoil of everything that he's doing and you know regardless of he if he is being possessed by spirit or not you know this is where his actions are laying him you no know, this is the course that he's going for right now so Kyoshi's still you know not quite ready to realize all this and it takes her a couple you know a bit more to actually really sort of like get this ingrained in her and even then she still has a hard time accepting it mm -hmm. uh, the next chapter is called second chances this is a pretty quick one it's basically just she leaves the capital and makes her decision that okay she now has to talk to um avatar Kurok. she has to get the information about what happened in the past with glowworm and so on so she takes a uh, a boat called sulan smile interestingly um and has the sailors basically bring her to where the sunken atoll is that uh, Kuruk sunk. That's where Yang Chen first did her water bending, and she's going to go back here again because this is where she got sort of um, at least a really clear vision. But she was pulled out by Jinpa very early on in the book, so now she's going to see this fully because this is where she can connect to him. So um, she notes, no matter how no matter how long it takes. For me to be under the water don't come in and get me and so she dives under and as she wakes up it's karuk talking to her and so um this is where we get you know, more of you know okay wh wh what are they here to talk about and karuk says the same thing as you your boy him and father glowworm i can guide you to what you seek it's why you're here now isn't it and so the first thing that comes up is like okay they're in the spirit world why aren't there any, any spirits around? And Karuk says, uh, most spirits tend to give me a wide berth. Why is that? Because I used to hunt them. And so the first sort of reveal that we sort of get here is that um, Karuk, who was noted in the first book as being the best hunter in the Four Nations, is also a spirit hunter. And this just makes Kyoshi even more angry than she was before that all this other stuff she's heard about him and now all of a sudden he hunts spirits as well she doesn't have the full story here but this just makes her even more infuriated at him that like she's like it's not fair she really loses her temper at this point and she like Yoon at the start of the book begins to morph the spirit world around her and um basically destroy it um but at the last second, you know, Kuruk kind of reaches out to her. Uh, and in, and as she goes to sort of slap his hand away, the touch is what sort of uh, starts the vision, basically. So um, this is where she's going to get her answers. But uh, what are your thoughts on this uh, brief uh, chapter here? Yeah, I mean, it was it was really quick. I mean, it's interesting, you know, to see the course of action that Kyoshi's now finally ready to take in order to you know figure out what's you know what's really happening what's been happening behind the scenes you no know, she's she's willing to go to the lengths that she needs to to talk to Kuruk. um so to see her you know sort of you know just dive in the water you know telling you know the the crew there not to get her at all um and for her to you know finally come face to face with him but even when she does come you know face to face with her previous past life um you no know, just still there's still another wall for her to sort of you know go through um just as far as you know getting the actual information here i mean makes you wonder if they you know had never connected you know at this last moment what would have you know happened to the air that they're in just sort of like her you know we've seen how you know the avatars or really anyone can manipulate the spirit world like what would have been you know sort of the, the ramifications of all of this but at the last second they are able to touch which is really good for the story that comes next mm, yeah. and the other important thing is that even though kyoshi really loses her temper here she does realize that no she won't lose herself to this as frustrated as she is and what she's destroyed in the spirit world does begin to heal itself and that will be they'll use this example as a contrast to you know what uh Kurok is going to show her with yoon in the the next uh, chapter which this is the big one this is probably the main chapter that i think everyone was waiting for in this book and um, lost friends so 
the second stage of the backstory, this continues on directly from the, the first bit, which was that it ended with uh, Karok wanting Kelsong to help him meditate into the spirit world. And so we pick up here with the idea that Karok is in the spirit world, but he's sort of been separated from Kelsong. And immediately he notices that there's like a dark spirit nearby trying to like break its way into the physical world. And that the area of the physical world it's trying to break into is basically the town where they're meditating nearby. And he can tell by the look of this spirit that it's out for blood. If it breaks through, it's going to kill people. So he quickly gets out of the spirit world, grabs Kelsong's glider and rushes to the this kind of uh, breakthrough basically between worlds that's about to happen on the other side. And uh, basically dives in after this spirit and he manages to defeat it. It's a big battle, Avatar versus a dark spirit. But he is forced into a situation where he kills this dark spirit. But it seems to have had a bad effect on him. And this is what they note, that he saves this town. But the effect killing a dark spirit has on him is sort of the the untold damage basically in that the next morning his friends found the avatar crawling blindly through the streets of Yao Ping, foaming at the mouth. Uh, it was days before he could speak. Um, destroying the spirit had cost him a piece of his own somehow. He was bleeding inside, losing something more vital than blood, vitality leeching away in a manner no healer could fix. He was cold. Him, a child of the north who laughed at blizzards and swam laps around icebergs, was cold. Nothing pumped through his veins. And so he's just in this inn to rest and like his friends were all really concerned about him. But he doesn't tell them about what happened because he doesn't want them to get involved with anything relating to an experience like that that he's just been through. And so what ends up happening is that he still struggles to basically get rid of this like feeling that has like inflicted him since the encounter with the spirit. And then they basically go into that becomes sort of a theme across the this whole chapter, this whole backstory that um, indulging in like his vices are like the only things that can make him sort of feel warm again and get rid of that sort of um, spiritual cold, I suppose is the best way you can say it. So this is where it brings up the whole idea of like women, alcohol and stuff like that. And then when he meets Nyatha, that gets doubled down on. They're the only things that seem to make him feel normal again. Um, but uh, we'll stop there because this is a really detailed chapter. So we'll start with just stop with just this first section. Uh, Greg, what are your thoughts on this uh, so a sudden turn here for Karuk's backstory? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really sad and really cool to finally get the actual, or at least the beginning part of this actual story of, you know, how, you know, what he actually had to do as, you know, an avatar that we've never really, you know, we've never known before. Um, so to get this part of the story to see how, you know, defeating the spirit, which we've seen in Korra, how it can be done, I guess, the more proper way, um, but with his, you know, with what he knew, you know, at the time as the avatar and, you know, sort of his, you know, upbringing, his background, you know, from being a hunter, he did what, you know, he thought was the best, um, which is really, you know, all that any sort of avatar can actually do. Um, and just to see how much it affected him, um, you know, just the fact that, you know, we know the avatar is a spirit and has one imbued with them. So the fact that he had to destroy one, however, you know, evil intention the spirit was for whatever reason you know he's still affected because of it um and just to see how long it took him to sort of like come back from that and you know he never even before he had to you know have like uh you know a, a more interaction with a a bigger sort of dark spirit um just even the ones on this level you know had a, a great effect on him as far as you know just sort of his his spiritual you know sort of wellness so it's, it's you know it's sad to see you know sort of his you know what was once such like a, a potential sort of like bright future for him as an avatar to slowly sort of like ebb away mm -hmm. yeah and 
as they go into the next stage, like this happens again. It's not just this one-off event. Uh, suddenly, on a visit to the Fire Nation, he has a dream about uh, some dark spirits about to attack through the world's uh, Ma'inka Island, which is the Sewan clan home island, which is a pretty interesting connection in that, like, if Karuk hadn't stopped that in the past, the Huazo situation we have right now probably wouldn't even be a thing. But that's just a, a fun little reference. And again, he's forced into a situation where the only thing he can do to stop this spirit is to go after it and attack it. And again, he kills it, but the same thing happens again. And it gets into this idea that, like, in a way, he is the perfect avatar to do this because he of all of the avatars seems to have like the most well-rounded sort of bending training because he's done so much of it uh he's studied like all aspects from so many different people and is extremely talented so many other avatars wouldn't be able to do this well against a powerful spirit like this but he kills it but this time when he you know drags himself up uh, after killing it he meets nyata for the first time so this is where we get the reveal again, we knew this from before, but for Karuk, Nyatha is from the Bonti tribe, and the Bonti tribe specifically sent Nyatha here to help Karuk. So somehow they knew from from a premonition actually that Karuk was involved in the with these dark spirit battles and so sent someone to help him. And this is gonna be the only person who helps him on this side of his life. Um this is where we get a further exploration of the um, Bonti tribe's special firebending technique, which is like a, uh, they say it here, it's a diagnostic ritual guiding heat along his energy pathways, similar to the way a northern healer would use the water within a patient's body. And it also seems to have some element of uh, healing someone's spirit. So Nyata is not able to heal Karuk fully from the kind of backlash of killing a dark spirit, but he can sort of um, calm it down a little bit so it's not as uh, heavy of an impact. But he does note to Karuk that um, the, a toll will be taken every time he fights one of these battles, and immediately he's going to be out of the running for longest era for an avatar in history. Um, so that's really, really interesting, especially when they go into the next section of like, he doubles down on the fact that he's not going to tell his other friends about this because he doesn't want them to get hurt trying to help him. And he then goes on to search the Bonti tribe libraries for any other way to handle spirits that doesn't involve just killing them. But such a technique didn't exist, which is obviously a reference to the fact that later on, hundreds of years later, Unalak would invent a technique as a way to basically defeat spirits without, like, harming them without it being a violent technique that being a uh, spirit bending of course um and uh yeah it, it just gets across that more and more spirit attacks come in and he has to face all of them and he becomes this is where he probably becomes the spirit hunter as well there's so many of these dark spirits that he has, has to actually learn how to hunt spirits and do that and again he's damaging himself he's uh, lowering his lifespan every single time he does this and has to have these long lengthy recovery processes uh, where barely anything can make him feel normal again and so it's just this very very dark path and the two of them never tell anyone that they're involved in this so they're the only two people that know about this and it feels like they feel like they're criminals basically because they're basically just killing spirits but it's to protect so so many people but this uh, middle section of the story greg uh, wh what are your thoughts on karuk's um uh, backstory up to this point yeah i mean you know the fact that he's meeting yeah uh, and he's you know i don't know, i think it's interesting just the fact that he does have at least you know one co-conspirator you know there's at least someone else who's attempting to help him to lead him on this sort of like you no know, self-appointed you no know, journey that he has to sort of save the world without the world actually knowing that he's doing anything i mean if you no know, and if you know the world did know maybe maybe things might have turned out differently who who can really say for sure um but you know you can see you know just more and more the toll that is taking on his body i mean 
it's just you know it's, it's kind of sad just to see you know him just sort of do do this and he you know, like he he recognizes that there probably is a better way or that there should be a better way of doing this despite him being you know such a great hunter he doesn't you know he doesn't want to sort of like end life in this way in such a such a manner but he really has you no know, at this point no no other way of going about it mm-hmm uh, at this point, it's also noted that like uh, his group of friends is also sort of beginning to sort of split up, go their separate ways. Uh, Heron gets married at this point, which is when uh, they give more context to why he wrote that poem for Heron that we heard about in the first novel. And the reason behind that is because like he wrote it like just after taking out a spirit. So it was in this very dark place for him and writing this poem was this way to sort of reconnect to like a, a better point in his life um but it was just meant to be this other darker moment for him here um but soon he eventually comes across um the reason why all these spirit attacks are happening because not every spirit has the ability to just come into the physical world like that so something has to be causing it so this is when he finds out about Father Glowworm. And we get the F Father Glowworm's full title here. Uh, Father Glowworm, the world borer, it within the whole. Um, and this is a spirit that has the power to rasp away at the barrier between the physical and the spiritual worlds. Um, and this is a spirit who also takes occasional humans uh, to eat, as we of course knew from before. And this, again, they get across the idea of this contract of exchanging names with it. And this is one that happens here. Um, the two of them were in this together for the long haul. The spirit declared, perhaps they would have fun. And so their fight nearly created a gaping hole in the boundary between realms. Father Glowworm was stronger than the other spirits and Karuk was too stubborn to die. Their energies bit into each other like blades clashing edge to edge, leaving per, uh, permanent notches. With a strike that nearly broke the foundations of the bedrock around them, Karuk wounded Father Glowworm grievously, the spirit diminishing in size and power several times over, but it managed to escape, wriggling away into an endless labyrinth of darkness. And so it's just noted that this is where the backstory pretty much ends. They would each marked each other. Neither of them would ever fully heal from the encounter. They would know each other in their bones forever, like old friends. So uh, what are your thoughts on this final section of the backstory here? Karuk finally encountering Glowworm. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like an awesome and sad battle um, at the same time. Just sort of him finally coming into you know conflict with who's been you know causing all of these issues um you know father glowworm of course doesn't care about you know any of these holes that he sort of have left open sneakily in you know places that you know most people or most you know people or spirits wouldn't necessarily notice but clearly some spirits have you know found these holes um but yeah no i mean it's it's really sort of like intense just the way that they're sort of going about you know explaining this sort of final confrontation and how you know just no there's no real you know resolution from it and, um i mean i think you know probably crook is like the worst end of it because we know father glowworm is still around even if he is you know quite weaker um which sort of leads to you know what happens later on um but you know father glowworm is still around is still able to you know in some form or fashion um still come to the hip um the human realm um but yeah this is pretty pretty intense just to see you know what was the result of everything and how this is pretty much you know sort of like the end of Kurok after this point yeah because uh, they come out of the uh, uh flashback at this point and uh, kiyoshi asked a few questions like why were there so many angry spirits during your era and Kurok like avoids the question he says that's a question for another day um and now you know this is where like i need to give you the final piece of information the takeaway to connect like his past to uh yoon um and she wants to know about like what about the rest of your memories like basically what happened next in your life and he just says there's little to see after i lost my friends and kiyoshi has this i think much better sense of karuk now because she she notes that like he he's this like giant character like so physically imposing 
but he has this deeply tragic backstory and that like she has her own like issues with like say John Ju and these connections to him but then this guy was also like best friends with all the, all these people and she honestly says to Karuk I'm glad I finally reached you avatar Karuk and there's just this noted moment here his shoulders hitched and then they eased she didn't consider he might have needed the connection as much as her assuming a past life could need anything so just that he's considers himself like a failure as the avatar all of this time so he's happy he can at least be of use to the current avatar and I think that's a really interesting perspective to have and and especially because the book doesn't attempt to bridge the gap between where this backstory ends and getting us to the Karuk and Umi situation with Ko. Um, it does leave a lot still to be there in, in the sense of like, okay, Karuk as a known spirit hunter, there's, a, there's more of a reason behind why Ko would go after him and take someone close to him away. Um, that fits. But it also creates a, so much more importance around like Umi as a character in that like Karuk is this like broken character at this point in time who is like known to be like borderline like this alcoholic at this point and that they, they note that he's like asleep or drunk at these like actual like meetings to determine like uh, you know the politics of the world and stuff like that. He's a big womanizer at this point so for him to sort of settle down and find love with Umi speaks quite highly of like what sort of a character she was that she was able to help him at this kind of low point in his life and then the double tragedy i suppose of just it's been bad already but then he finally finds someone and then she's taken away you see why he's he's so angry at ko and would go after him and try to kill him and why you know the the fight with glowworm probably one of the worst effects for him that it had is that he probably wasn't powerful enough to defeat Ko after the Glowworm fight. So I like that there's a few connections, but I also do wish that they had covered the full backstory just to make all the connections. But um, what are your thoughts on, on this backstory and I suppose how it fits in with the Karuk that we know from before these books? The, the Karuk that we basically only knew from the, the appearance in the finale and escape from the spirit world. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> It does give you, for sure, a different sort of perspective of him as, like, a character and sort of what he's had to go through and just sort of, you know, what we know of him with Ko and Umi and just sort of that whole situation. I mean, yeah, it does speak a lot to her character that, you know, she was able to sort of bring him back from, like, the verge of despair, um, essentially, as far as we can tell from what we have here. Um yeah, I, I can. Yeah, I think it would have been interesting to know, you know, sort of what had happened. I don't know if I mind it too much, not really sort of like knowing the full detail. I think that would be cool to know, sort of just like, I don't. Know, I mean, you know, going based off of the fight that you know was here with um Father Glowworm, that would have been interesting to see how how the whole thing down went down with Ko. But I don't know with Ko as a spirit and him sort of, I don't know, seeing even if he's not sort of like. A dark spirit per se just the way that he comes off as a character and sort of like his sort of vengeance from the little bit that we do know so we don't know how he was you know before he became as his way since it seems like some spirits do have the ability even with on their own you know, the ability to sort of like change and adapt um that might have been interesting to know but yeah i mean just the whole idea that this is the point where you know kiyoshi is better able to sort of understand Quirk, even if, you know, she herself doesn't have, like, the full story and wants to know more, just like how we do. I think it's, it's definitely uh, a big turning point in the story for her. Mm -hmm. And then the last bit is that Quirk uh, needs to show Kyoshi something, and he brings her to a point in the spirit world where it's similar to what just happened previously with Kyoshi, with uh, her emotions ripping a hole in the spirit world. But this hole is still open, and it's noted that this is one that Yoon made it's still open because he still feels this way that all of the these people he's trying to kill it's not going to close he's purposefully left it open and Kyoshi's like yeah yeah I know because um he's being influenced by father glowworm so that's why he still feels this way and Karuk has to finally reveal to her like the final sort of nail in her like 
her view of like how she could save Yoon is, no, you've held on to that excuse long enough. What I need to tell you is that the spirits that the, is that spirits can possess a human being's body, and they might even merge with a person to give them new shapes and forms, but they don't take over people's thoughts. Yoon is in complete control of his actions. He has been this whole time. And Kyoshi's response is just, oh, oh, uh, and Kurok just has to apologize to her about this. And it's at this point their meeting ends, the, the people on the boat do actually pull her up, even though she asks to not be pulled up. But um, it's just like a more fun moment at the end, like, how dare you defy your avatar? But she has all the information she needs. Emotionally, she better understands Yoon because of what um, Zoryu told her. And revealed to her and now technically she knows it is impossible for Yoon to be under the influence of a spirit if he feels this way it's because he feels this way and so this should set in stone the need to confront him because she is the core reason behind why he is so angry and can't kind of get over it it's because the problem is here um, with her even though Yoon hasn't directly told her that or said that to her, she now knows that's the real reason behind it all. But what are your thoughts on this um, final uh, page or two from this chapter? Yeah, I mean, now she's at like maybe two-thirds of the way of finally, you know, realizing what Yoon is really about. She's still, you know, there's still a bit more for her to really sort of like have it ingrained in her and willing to go to lengths that she has to go to but now she you know i guess understands the process of how you know spirits and human sort of interact um with you with each other which is cool to see how you know they just sort of lay that out here but yeah she is eventually able to pull out of the water despite her previous protests mm -hmm. Next chapter is our uh, final interlude. It's called Interlude, The Man from the Spirit World. So this is where we finally catch up with the full extent of what Yoon has gone through. So at the end of the last one, we uh, find out that Yoon actually consumed Glowworm. He ate Glowworm, not the other way around. And so this is where we find out the effect that that has. So he begins to suddenly, once he remembers Jonju and that Jonju did this to him, he suddenly decides that like he's just going to start burying his way through the earth. Not with his earth bending, but just literally just with his hands. He just starts to you know, start digging like that. And he manages to dig his way all the way through the world. So he goes through the spirit world into the physical world and ends up back, of course, in the physical world. And um, so that reveals that consuming glowworm gave him his powers which fits um but then we obviously find out he's back in the physical world he he needs to drink and eat to survive so he makes his way to the nearest town there's a well there but he's refused a drink at the well because the governor that runs it requires you to have um uh, special tags to take a drink um he's told to go to like one of the businesses nearby maybe they'll give you a drink and they're like they don't immediately give it to him, but like when he tries to be like, oh, they're sort of interested in the Avatar, and they know Avatar Yoon, maybe I can use that to my advantage. Because of course, this is when it's not public knowledge that Kyoshi is the Avatar, because we're in a flashback here. So he's like, actually, it was me. Like, I, I negotiated the deal on the iceberg with Tagaka. I'm Avatar Yoon. And because he's so like messed up, because it's from a fight in the spirit world and so on, he's so dirty. They don't fully make the connection that it's him, Avatar Yoon. So they ask him, like, oh, well, if you're the Avatar, let's just have you prove it. Water bend this water into your mouth and you can have it. And this is what makes Yoon snap. Because he's defeated Glowworm and everything up to now. It's been like, okay, th this explains some of the technical points, but it doesn't explain why he's so angry and out to kill. Something has to make him snap and here's what it is being so directly reminded that he's not the avatar he's made his way back to the physical world when he probably shouldn't have been able to and immediately encounters resistance on the fact that oh yeah i'm not the avatar which is the reason he was sort of thrown away by Jonju in the first place and it's just these people like not not even doing anything too particularly wrong but just to the wrong person at the exact wrong time saying the wrong thing 
it just like ruins him basically at this point and so he just loses it at this point and snaps and the idea is just that this is where he discovers the full scope of his powers he kills a lot of these people and sort of like gains control of the town he gets his drink and seems to now revel in basically killing people who are like disrespectful towards him um and so you know filled with new purpose Yoon took off down the road whistling as he went and he just notes that like he's been fired he's not the avatar anymore but he now has a pretty large list of people that he wants to, to take out and he knows that it's something he can do so uh, I, I really like this chapter i think they did a great job um at showing that final transition for Yoon. But uh, Greg, what are your thoughts on this final interlude with Yoon? Yeah, they went through a lot of characterization of him as far as, you know, him, you know, slowly like coming to realize, you know, what his previous purpose in life was, how he was so set on, you know, sort of making people happy, making the world happy, making the world sort of like, a better place towards you know just everything by you know doing what was considered to be sort of the right thing and you know how people at the time you know really sort of respected what he was doing but now that he's you know sort of been thrown to the wayside can't prove you know who he really is and you know he could never even do that before um you know it's really it's too much for his mind for his you know sort of being to really sort of take here and just sort of the the explosion of anger the explosion of his you know newfound power that you know he mentions himself that he's going to have to sort of figure out how to like rein it in and control it so that you know everyone around him doesn't sort of just like scatter as soon as he comes into the vicinity um you know you can see you know just sort of like the quick change of his sort of personality here. I mean, it's it's probably something that was almost always like sort of there below the surface, but now, you know, it's been completely brought to the top, just like how he, you know, came out of the spirit world. And it's just sort of, it's all that he can see at this point is just sort of, you know, getting back revenge for what was or what he thought was previous his. And it still doesn't seem like maybe he quite sort of understands the reason that he's sort of doing everything but he has you know like you mentioned he has this you know sense of purpose um and he's just going to go through with it with all the knowledge and skills and you know techniques that he's been trained um up until this point yeah and this is why it is so important that they revealed earlier on in the book that yeah he has had assassination training so now that he has all this power he does actually have the ability to kill people and he's skilled at it as well because he is one of the most talented earthbenders already now he's on a whole other level but uh, the next chapter is home again and interestingly this is the point in the book where they decide to do a time skip there's a month time skip between basically um her, kyoshi leaving zoryu and when this chapter itself takes place and given that we've talked about already the fact that this book is a uh, hundred pages shorter than the uh, first book it's at this section of the story that it feels like it's very much missing. Uh, there's, there's stuff missing. They could have done a chapter or two here. I appreciate what they were trying to do here in that they obviously have the return of a lot of characters as like a surprise in the middle of this chapter. But I don't think that's worth missing out on like characterization scenes that we probably should have seen. In that I would have liked to have seen Kyoshi's training with Ottawa how she makes things up to Rangi after going back to her. I almost feel like that's probably like the biggest like missed thing in the entire book and I don't get why it's almost forgotten that like we haven't seen Rangi in a bunch of chapters from like closer to like the almost like the halfway point in the book at this point. Um and we're fine with just oh surprise she's here and we we're not going to come back to it. Um, so I suppose before we even get into this chapter, Greg, uh, what are your thoughts on the fact that um, they decide to do a time skip at this point? Mm. I mean, the time skip in itself, like you mentioned, doesn't really bother me. I think, you know, the two things that you did mention, you know, sort of the reconciliation with Rangi and sort of the training would have been cool to see. I mean, 
I don't know. I mean, I guess the training, you know, even in this chapter and later on, you know, she mentions, Kyoshi mentions how, like, that was, like, so important to her as, like, far as, like, you know, her being able to sort of save people when she was, when she wasn't able to do that before. So that seems like that would be, would have been a good chance for her to have, you know, some extra characterization. I mean, I don't, I don't think that would have added too much to her her overall as a character. Like, you know, what we know of her at this point is, you know, it is what it is. It's not, like, going to change her core character. Like, we already know that she wants to be able to heal, and we knew that this was something that she was really into before. It just would have been, like, a cool thing to see. The part with her and Ronge, I think that, that seems like that might have been actually better to have. Or just, you know, seeing that with um, Heyron and just everything, I don't know. It might have been interesting to see sort of like the in-between sort of like politics of the Fire Nation, maybe to see sort of like what happened in this little bit, you know, being what we know what happens in the epilogue and what um, Chari sort of tries to do. Um, maybe that would have also been another thing that would have been cool to see. Um, so there are a couple things that could have been there. I don't know, you know, if that would have been, you know, worth uh what is it like the hundred more pages that we would have been to make this on par with the first one i don't know i don't know if it would have been quite enough for that but it probably would have been cool to have those little bits um but you know what we got from here is pretty interesting yeah like i i definitely don't think they needed like a hundred extra pages but it feels like a chapter to do something like i understand like especially with the um the flying opera company members like keeping them a little bit of a secret but like it shouldn't be a surprise that Rangi joins in the final battle and the fact that they skip over like a pretty decent character dynamic between the two of them. Uh, sort of the same with like Heron, like the, the fact that she isn't also hasn't been in the book for quite a while. And I feel like Kiyoshi finally like knowing the full details about Yoon, her getting a final talk in a way from Heron go, going into that final battle, I think is almost like something that's required as well. Um, but anyway, let's get into home again, the chapter itself. So Kyoshi returns home to Yokoya, and as she goes inside, uh, she obviously gets the message that I'm inside, so Yoon is here, because uh, the, the reason they sort of end up meeting here is, of course, because Karuk and Glowworm were linked by their energies, and because Yoon has eaten Glowworm, Yoon is now connected to Kyoshi in that same way. They can sense where each other are, so they gradually were drawn, of course, back to this important location. We see Auntie Mui is here, and she's happy to have her, her two kids basically back here in the mansion, but they ask her to go out and get some food for them, uh, and Kyoshi specifically asks for stock nose mushrooms, which were stated, of course, much earlier on in the book to be a crop that didn't gr grow particularly well this uh, season, so no one actually has them. So she won't be able to get them, but she'll be gone long enough searching for them that she'll miss what happens here. Because this is a, a fight that is about to break out here, basically. And um, yeah, th that's what we get here. We, we pretty much just have some quick back and forths, but ultimately a fight is basically what is about to happen. Um, Yoon starts it off, he does some powerful earthbending, he brings a lot of earth into play in the mansion, and there's just this like power off here as they just you know take bits of earth out of this giant pillar to try and kill each other they destroy the mansion no one hits each other um but the notable thing here is that previously kiyoshi had the power advantage over yoon when before yoon ate uh, glowworm now it seems like yoon is actually the more powerful one because already technique wise he's better than kiyoshi but he can absolutely match her power now. So uh, this is probably the clearest example that um, Yoon is greatly, greatly empowered by uh, having Glowworm inside of him. Um, it's to the point where it kind of feels like borderline sort of like Avatar level. I wouldn't say it's quite Avatar state level, but it's like half Avatar state almost. Um, Greg, uh, I suppose, what are your thoughts on that, seeing you and that is like most powerful here in this fight? How would you view the the level of empowerment that Glowworm gives him? Yeah, it seems like maybe it's on like the level of like, you know, the quick flash into the Avatar state as far as like his base level ability. Like it's, it's not like going to like, you know, create like a huge like mountain that's going to take down anything, but 
with the boost that he has along with like just his general skill and precision that he clearly already had that that's that seems like it's enough that if he uses it in the right way he can overpower Kyoshi's sort of like baseline ability especially since she's still like using her fans for the most part and she still has like you know just sort of like the you know underdeveloped sort of like earth bending skill of not really being you know sort of like trained in it for like years and years and not necessarily with like sort of like the best masters in the world which is what yoon had up until this point um so from you know from a pure power level that's what it sort of seems i mean in the beginning of the fight when they have sort of like the pillar in the beginning um you know it almost seems like you know kyoshi does like the last final move where she like pushes all of it um towards his side but it doesn't really give her any sort of advantage it's just sort of like her being tired with them going like one for one for the whole like initial part of the fight there so it definitely seems like he has like a definite advantage um, on her sort of like baseline earthbending abilities until more stuff gets starts getting thrown into the fight. Mm, yeah, like this is where you really see like Yoshi's sort of lack of subtlety as a bender in that yeah she just pushes the the kind of uh, the hold out pillar onto him and he doesn't counter it with power even though he probably could. He's just like mm, dodge into the floor to get away from it. Uh, highlighting that he sort of better uses the sort of strength and power that he has um because kyoshi's like not even like a master of all of her elements at this point because like she still has that sort of earth bending sort of weird situation where she typically is like high power but she has to use her fans to do the precision stuff um arguably fire is one of her most you know powerful elements because she's had so much training from rangi um i suppose it's it's implied she's had her earth uh, sorry air bending training with the monks but uh water bending uh outside of the recent ottawa training like she's still not amazingly i suppose skilled at that because she only had a very small amount of water bending training with uh, kirima so um there's it's it's definitely a clash of like someone who's been trained a large amount of their life versus um Kyoshi, who's still pretty new to it, but it's still a, a very cool fight. Um, they're basically just back and forth chasing each other. Yoon is kind of taunting her for the most part. He's not going all out here. Kyoshi eventually says, you know, uh, whether you kill me today here or not, you have to let go of what happened. And her telling him to let go of his feelings sort of changes things. He actually gets sort of a bit angry at Kyoshi. And so he demonstrates a bit more of the full extent of his power. And so he liquefies earth here and uh, basically wraps this liquid earth all around Kyoshi and then solidifies it. He like does like this perfect encasing within earth to where this is like a, on a whole other level than the typical way of like restraining people with earth that we see. And this obviously is another sort of thing people have speculated about before of just like can you do something like that with earth and that he basically is like water bending with earth such as the the skill that he has and this is that that example of just how powerful he is and that like the second i read a lot of what he does here i was kind of thinking that he's so powerful that i think like if he tried he could probably metal bend if he put the effort into concentrating on metal but he doesn't need to do that at this point so it doesn't happen but um yeah liquefying kiyoshi in uh earth here it's pretty incredible at this point um and this is like just before everyone else arrives so uh what are your what are your thoughts on uh this part of the fight like like one-on-one -on -one, this kind of highlights yoon beats kiyoshi because he completely restrains her here yeah, I mean, his his skill and his technique is definitely, you know, I don't, I don't think most people would have an issue with that sort of being higher than Kyoshi's just because of all the training that he has and just his his general talent. I mean, that seems to be like the running theme that we've had with Yoon as a character is that like his talent for understanding things and being able to, you know, incorporate them into his own sort of like way of doing things, even if he isn't sort of like a firebender or a waterbender or airbender like he has like the baseline understanding of all of those sort of like 
techniques um, in order to use them. I mean, the idea that he is able to sort of like liquefy or at least make, you know, um, make Earth look like it's being liquefied to that extent just shows like the extent of his ability um, and the way that he can flow um, the Earth. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kyoshi is saved from this by the arrival of uh, Jimpa sort of flying support up in the air on his bison. Uh, Rangi arrives as well as uh, Kirima and Wong from the Flying Opera Company. Uh, Wong, they reveal like he's a he's a pretty detailed earthbender. He's one of the few you would trust getting you out of such a heavy uh, containment by Earth. Um, and so it becomes this giant like five on one fight. But Yoon still puts on a show basically around them that they are doing all these like double team moves and like especially like the flying opera company members plus rangi they're all very agile able to dodge his a lot of his moves but even they're struggling against him they slightly put him on the defensive just because it is so many characters but um none of it's really doing that much damage and um he he, he begins to take it a lot more seriously after Rangi does like a giant attack here. Like she does the full on like deep breaths, like triple charged fire attack. And it, it seems to be like a homing fire attack. She, she, she sort of controls it after she lets it loose. And Yoon kind of just notes that like, wow, that would have like killed me if it hit me. So I think this is probably one of our first times we've seen something like that from a firebender just putting like everything into just like one big attack that they note here is so intense it nearly goes from yellow to white so as you increase the temperature you know the, the, the color change of fire um a lot of the big bending begins to happen here but yoon's response to this is that like oh for the first time in the fight he actually uses like a bending stance so he does the Janju bending stance which of course has been described as sort of like steady on the bottom like wild on top and basically they just get across the idea that in this stance he just has like control over every single piece of earth around him in like a pretty wide area and he can basically make the earth like earthquake uh he can liquefy it he he can control the ground as if it's almost like a liquid basically he he controls the the ground around the, around them uh so anyone who has their feet on the ground is at risk from him so everyone sort of like stands on top of buildings to uh stay away from his power um so wh what are your thoughts on the fight at this point with the 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 multi-bender fight going on here yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, you know, the way that they describe it and sort of like the back and forth and how they're sort of like using their abilities to sort of try to get Yoon into a corner is definitely really cool to see how they sort of describe the fight here. But he, it doesn't know, and we can see that he isn't really having that much of a, a struggle um, at all for the most part. I mean, even if it is, you know, so many against one, you know, his, his ability to move around on the earth, which is, you know, what they're all sort of fighting on, um, even if they are sort of like, you know, jet stepping or, you know, earth stepping or whatever into the sky, um, you know, they mentioned they still need sort of like a base for that. And of course he, you know, as an earthbender and his sort of skill um, has control of that base. So there's only, there's really only so much that they can do once he actually starts getting really serious after the huge blast from Rangi. Mm -hmm. So it's at this point he decides, like he's sort of done with the fighting, he wants to take out all these extra people that are involved, so he sends a, a giant like hail of shards of uh, earth up into the air at uh, Jimpa to save uh, his bison. He basically takes the hit himself, so Jimpa takes an earth like dagger straight through the shoulder, and he's out of the fight. Uh, Kirima and Wong get their legs broken when they run along the ground, and they think they're aware of the way he's sort of like making the ground turn into a wave. But he just slams his fists into the ground and just makes like a, a small trench open up beneath them and they're running full speed so they just fall into this legs broken they're out of the fight and then this forces of course uh, kyoshi and rangi to team up and it seems to be like a finishing blow here they're a uh, fire fire bending combination move together but yoon dives into the ground pops up behind uh, rangi stabs her uh, in the back and 
it seems like oh Rangi's about to die here um as the the fight is pretty much at its end here uh what were your thoughts on i suppose yoon just sort of going for it here and delivering all of these like pretty much like finishing blows where he like injures basically everyone in the fight yeah i mean it just shows you what he could have done from the beginning if he wasn't sort of like either semi-conflicted or just was you no know, just didn't see the need to do it at you no know, the earlier point in time until he really saw that there was like an issue that maybe he potentially could lose i don't i don't know i don't feel like he really thinks that he was in any sort of like super danger um sort of like to begin with it doesn't seem like I don't know it doesn't feel like he's coming across that way here but yeah i mean in in pretty quick succession he's able to sort of like incapacitate pretty much everybody um without you no know, too much of an issue i mean even the huge blasts um that rangi and kiyoshi do which you know probably would have uh ended him if not for some of his you know sort of newfound abilities um you know he was just easily able to sort of avoid it and it was cool how they did sort of do that just sort of the whole sort of like jet stepping in the air with the fire bending and the fact that they were able to sort of like communicate what they were going to do and it it definitely did surprise him but just he's just so overpowered um at this point that even even when he's surprised he still you know is able to get out of it mm -hmm. and so we get into this section where Typically, this would be when your avatar goes avatar state. Her girlfriend has just taken a seemingly lethal blow. This should be avatar state. But Kiyoshi holds it back because she knows that if she goes into the avatar state here, she'll be in so little control. She probably will like destroy everyone around her, including the people who've just been injured. And if there's any chance to save Rangi, her going into the avatar state will basically ruin it because you know she still sort of blames herself because she basically destroyed Kelsong's body when she went into the avatar state after his death so that's a uh, the point that's being made here so she holds back and realizes at this point she has to actually truly address what was discussed with uh, Zoryu and so on with Karuk and she apologizes she just comes out and says it i'm sorry i'm star i'm sorry i stole your avatar hood and she says it really low so yoon has to kind of come over to her to really hear it um, and she's just like it was yours and i took it from you i'm sorry i robbed you of everything i'm sorry i stole your future i regret everything i regret what i did to you so much and he's really happy about this finally that he 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 finally is open about like this is what he wanted in the first place in a way that's good to hear what else are you sorry for kiyoshi maybe you should apologize for what you said to me earlier telling me that i uh, i should just forget what happened that was a terrible thing for you to say and she just says i'm sorry for saying you had to live with your pain and she puts her palm to his chest in a gesture of comfort and she says because you won't and she immediately activates full force overdoes it Atuat's technique which of course is to lower the temperature of the water within a person's body but she purposefully crazy overpowers it so she immediately freezes him basically straight through so she freezes his organs including his heart his lungs and just he's he's dead on the spot basically it's this like instant kill water bending move here and um, that's just so devastating and he just slides to the ground straight away immediately and she finally does use the avatar state but it's actually a relatively weak application of it just to get some water to use for healing on rangi and uh, that's what she uses the avatar state for and she's done the, the training with ottawa so she can actually uh you know cool rangi down heal her for the most part but um yeah that is the end of the fight with yoon it's a very you know plot related way how he's defeated like she uses sort of his emotions against him because she didn't actually have any chance in a one-on-one -on -one fight against him and she had to deliver a lethal blow like that straight away or it was over so uh what were your thoughts on the end of this fight 
Yeah, no, I mean, it was definitely very sort of like, I mean, like, I guess sort of like telegraph sort of moves from as far as the plot goes, as far as like we know about disability, we know that it can be devastated if used in the wrong way. And you no, know, here we actually get to see how it's used and Kiyoshi's forced to use it on, you know, her best friend, despite everything that has, you know, happened in the past here. So it's, it's a very, you know, sad moment for, you know, when Kiyoshi finally realizes this is what she has to do. Um, but, you know, this is all so that she doesn't have to go through like sort of like the huge mistake of going into sort of like the avatar state and, you know, destroying everything around her. So it shows a, a lot of strength in her character of the way that she actually had to do this despite everything. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a kind of time cut here as she basically has done her best to sort of heal everyone, splinting up the broken legs and focusing her healing on Rangi and Jimpa, who have the most heavy injuries. No one is dead, no one's going to die, but she sort of says like, Rangi especially does need Ottawa to be here to make sure she fully heals properly and has no like permanent damage. But Rangi's well enough to get up and there's just a little bit of a conversation at the end of like, is it over? Yes, it is. And the chapter just ends with just that idea of, you know, together they cried for their friend because in a way, like that's what the whole book has sort of been about. It's like having hope that they there's some way to save him. But in the end, there wasn't anything that pretty much the second John Ju like betrayed Yoon and let him be taken by Glowworm. Yoon was gone. This was kind of the only way it was ever going to end. Such was the level of betrayal that happened at that point. The fact that John Ju committed so heavily to Yoon is the Avatar without ever fully confirming it and then you know um basically abandoning him the second it's revealed to not be the case that led to this situation where you know here his his two best friends have to cry after sort of assisting in killing him it's a really really tragic thing but it's also for kiyoshi this kind of final point of she's she's able to go to the extremes she needs to to take out villains like zu ping on and now it's sort of revealed she can do that as well, even if it's someone close to her. Um, and so that's a moment of growth for this character here, who is always going to be the one that, you know, um, only in justice can there be peace type thing. So, you know, pretty nice emotional sort of ending to this chapter of just that. Yeah, he was the villain of this book, but he was also their best friend. But uh, Greg, what were your thoughts on uh, the end of this chapter? Yeah, no, definitely very emotional. Just the fact that they're both sort of like, you know, have to cry over their friend because of what he, you know, was eventually turned into. Um, and, you know, it's just sort of the circumstances around that that sort of led, you know, all of them down this path. You know, could there have been potentially another way um, with them all sort of like being together? Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, but, you know, just sort of what sort of happened here. So, you know, they're, you know, just going to have to deal with this. And this is definitely a defining moment for her as a character and just sort of what she's, you know, like you said, what lengths she's willing to go through um, throughout her whole, you know, avatar hood. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we move into the next chapter, which is called The Meeting. Uh, there's a quick section right at the start that it's, it's basically sort of like Yoon's funeral. They create his uh, gravestone here. And it's just kind of Kyoshi noting that Typically, the way that this would be done is by noting what, like, day in the era of the Avatar that the person died on. But she doesn't want to put her own name on his gravestone, given that that would be, like, literally saying, Yoon, not the Avatar. This was the era, the, the date in the era of the actual Avatar you died in. So his his grave is unfortunately really really barren it just says Yoon from Makapu and the only people you know there at his funeral basically are Kiyoshi and Rangi so you know really just doubling down on just how tragic ultimately that this is uh, that there are only two people there at the end for him given that he was thought to be sort of the the second the real second coming of uh, Kurok in a way that's how good of an avatar he was expected to be but he ended up not being the avatar. So 
lots of interesting stuff. Um, there's a there's a sort of Rangi's final scene in the book here is just them sort of noting that uh, you know, uh, I don't know, I can't tell you anything for certain about the future, only that I'll be there for you, and uh, kiss and she kisses Kiyoshi and leaves limping down the hill. Um, I think that's definitely one thing with this book that like given that a lot of people really like Kiyoshi and Rangi's relationship, um. I feel like it almost there should have been like a stronger Kyoshi Rangi moment right here at the end, um. But you know this is this is fine, um. Because I, I think a lot of people were worried there would end these two books with Rangi having died somewhere along the line, just because like we still have to get to like Coco somehow, unless they're gonna say Coco's non-canon anymore, um. So there's some questions still about like, okay, what Kyoshi's relationships going forward is it just Rangi or are there going to be other ones as we go forward in her life we just don't know um but uh yeah do, do you have any thoughts there on the kind of quick funeral scene there for Yoon um yeah I mean I think it's you know it's, it's just kind of sad just stating just the fact that he he and Kyoshi really didn't come from anything um so there's not much for them to sort of like leave behind especially up and up until this sort of point here so it's just sort of a very sort of like sad end um to them and yeah i mean i think it is interesting you know what they would do sort of going forward with their relationship you no know, kyoshi and rangi and how that would be seen for it i mean i don't know if i had the thought that they would sort of like and her because of what we do know of Kyoshi in the future and especially with how long Kyoshi actually lives however you know that works as far as you know her life and her relationship goes there's like a lot of time that we don't know about um anything sort of like specific so like it really could be like sort of anything there so I don't know if I expected their like relationship to sort of like end this one and at least from this sort of last line here, we know that you no, know, they'll be together for some period of time um, until you know whatever happens, or you know Rangi dies, or since we don't know, you no, know, she probably won't live as long as Kyoshi. So I don't know. It's interesting to see you know what that could have been if they did happen to keep going with the story. Mm. Uh, then we get probably one of I think for anyone who's read the book and followed the the sort of news that was coming out before the book came out. This is a very odd point in the book because we knew going into this that at some point in this book we were going to find out what Kiyoshi's sort of animal guide is, what her uh, animal companion is going to be. So there was a lot of hype around this point because it was a point specifically said, like, like it was literally used as sort of like a marketing thing of like, and if all these things about the book don't uh, interest you, tell them that we find out who comp Kiyoshi's animal companion is, and. It's basically revealed here over the over the course of this chapter that it's this it's a knowledge seeker basically it's it's a fox and at the end of the chapter they basically confirm it's a spirit as well so it's not even just an animal it's a, it's a spirit um th th this to me was a kind of weird and also oddly disappointing reveal because it's like isn't really what you said it is and nothing in the chapter makes it inherently clear that it's her animal companion necessarily one because it's a spirit and then two there doesn't obviously seem to be that much of a connection between the two because it literally just leads her down here to this meeting with Yang Chen and then back up to where she was before so Greg what's your take on the whole uh, Kyoshi animal companion thing here and the fact that it's basically this knowledge seeker i guess yeah i mean i don't know i mean I, I don't know i mean one way i think like it kind of fits her as like a character as far as like her her idea of like wanting to sort of like understand things that she doesn't know and sort of like her you know something that can potentially help her you know sort of I don't know understand the world better or understand just the things around her so from that aspect of like being able to sort of like you know like we see here lead her to places is you know it's a cool little thing um as far as like what we would think of you know traditionally however that works as far as like your typical sort of like animal guide animal companion for you know our avatar really for like anyone in general um you know it wouldn't be like the first thing that I probably would think of. I mean, I don't know, I guess, you know, animal companions for, you know, 
characters don't necessarily have to be sort of like the big character or the big sort of animal character that you know you can ride on top of you know that's probably you no know, typically what we think with like you know appa and whatnot um but i don't know i think i don't know maybe it was just us reading too much into the hype and the marketing i don't know it, you know i saw most of that stuff too as well and it definitely mm seemed like it would have been more prominent than what we sort of got here like there would have been like you no know, like at least one scene where there's like you no know, a ride if that would be the case or somewhere where the you know the animal guy would actually sort of like protect kyoshi from something that's i got typically what you would think of as far as like what an animal sort of companion would do or even like even if it's not the biggest um sort of like companion like they're usually very sort of like we see them do something very sort of like active, I guess would be more of the term, um, as far as like actually like helping, you know, our characters along, which it did help. It led her to Yang Chen, which, you know, is pretty important considering, you know, what happens next. Um, but I don't know, maybe maybe that's enough. Maybe there's more to it that we just will never know about. Yeah, I, I think my thing is just that if he didn't say that beforehand, I would never have interpreted this scene as in any way being this is Kyoshi's animal companion, like, at all. Like I said, because of the spirit at the end and so on. So, the fact that he was so clear about, like, the book reveals her animal companion mm -hmm. and then this is it, it's like, really? Like, like, like even one of the kind of uh, less important ones, like, say, Wan and Mula, he at least saves her and it's meant to show this like he's different than the other people that they're they're meant to go out there to hunt but he hesitates with this animal and saves it and from there their dynamic continues and Mula carries him across the world and his journeys and so on and um, but this is like okay like it, it's hard to like it's it's hard to not just view it as being like a, a more of a spiritual thing and less like a personal thing between her and an animal especially when they don't really confirm that like this animal is going to like continue with her like that's that like she doesn't like pick it up or name it or anything like that to really double down on that this is what it is um but anyway it does guide her down to meet with yang chen and when kiyoshi sees her for the first time kiyoshi just sort of like breaks down uh, and it's like, no, 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 no. Because Kyoshi thinks it's her getting a vision of her mother, Jaisa. Uh, and they specifically note here that from Kyoshi's point of view, Yang Chen, it's not just that she's comparing two airbender women and saying that they look the same. They're literally making notes that like, no, actually Yang Chen had traits that were actually somewhat similar to Jaisa. So Kyoshi's sort of, you know, valid in what she's kind of reacting to here. And Yang Chen is like, who do you think I am? But when she realizes what's going on here, she does like hug Kiyoshi and say, I'm so sorry I wasn't there for you, but I am now. Everything's going to be all right. And I like after everything that's happened that they do have that sort of a moment where like Kiyoshi's still very young in this scene, um, despite everything that's happened. That she's been strong throughout the fight with Yoon and the aftermath, but... I do kind of like that there's just this moment that just references the fact that, you know, her, her parents are gone, she still has a lot of conflicted feelings about that, and one of the past avatars happens to look quite like her mother, so here's just a moment for someone to just be there for her. Um, what were your thoughts on this uh, interesting first meeting with Yang Chen? Yeah, I mean, I guess the initial sort of, like, breakdown of you know kiyoshi just sort of with the relation you know the similarities with her her mother and yang chen i think is interesting just because of like you mentioned i mean she is you know she is very young she still has you know those feelings of um abandonment that she's you know grown up with throughout her whole sort of life here so you no know, it's you know I, I think it's just you know another one of those moments where she just has to recognize the feelings that she had i mean she did you know sort of a similar thing with Kurok once you know he mentioned him sort of like battling the spirit so i think she's you know eventually she is able to sort of like rein herself in but you know she she definitely needs like a moment to sort of like collect herself before she's able to sort of like actually sort of like start asking things and you know sort of understanding what's actually going on here mm -hmm. 
So w once they they get past like this and uh, and uh, Kyoshi calms down, she immediately you know finally starts to talk to Yang Chen because Yang Chen is the avatar she's wanted to talk to this entire time. She's not wanted to go through Karuk. She's always wanted to go to Yang Chen because Yang Chen is is one of the greats, best avatar ever, basically. And she says, um, you're the first person I've been able to talk to about being a proper avatar. And Yang Chen's just like, um, did Karuk not talk to you about anything? And she's like, uh, Karuk spent his days battling dark spirits, not... And then Yang Chen finishes and is like, uh, let me ask you a question, Kyoshi. Have you ever wondered why there were so many dark spirits during Karuk's time? I asked him, but he wouldn't tell me. Did he provoke them? Turn them dark somehow? And Yang Chen answers, big moment here, no, Kyoshi, I did. Um, I tried my best to nurture human growth in the Four Nations. When people inevitably butted up against the spirits, I sided with humans more often than not. The heart walker of Yaoping Mountain, the phoenix eels living in the underground caverns of Ma'inka, General Old Iron, many spirits came to me with their complaints of human transgression against their territories. I told them they should leave the physical world alone and trust their lands and waters would be represented, would be rep respected by the uh, humans living nearby, and I trusted those humans to respect the balance of their surroundings. Some people upheld their ends of the bargain, many did more did not. Kyoshi, every, t every avatar makes mistakes, and I was fairly consistent in mine. Uh, when humans violated the promises I made on their behalf too many times, the spirits turned dark and wrathful. Those were the ones Karuk was forced to hunt down. None of that was your fault, uh, but Yang Chen disagrees. I gave each nation everything it wanted, but I only realized my error too late. Perhaps people shouldn't uh, have everything they want. No one is entitled to their every desire. To live in balance, we must willingly decide not to take all we can from the world and from others. My choices ultimately led to Karuk's suffering. The poor boy thought it was his duty to maintain my legacy and reputation, so he did it alone without sharing his burden. I might have done things differently had I known how much pain I'd be causing my successor. And she just notes that I can tell you're a bit disappointed about this reveal, that even the great Yang Chen has her own mistakes, and that Yang Chen's actions led to what happened to Karuk. Um, I think this is one of the best sections of the book to have this reveal come out that Yang Chen has always sort of been viewed to a degree this way. Uh, we have, of course, the rift, which is referenced here with Old Iron, that directly, you know, shows us at least a, somewhat of a mistake that Yang Chen made with dealing with the spirits. But it was never like a, a massive one. But here finding out that actually she's done that same thing so many times and Karuk had to deal with like basically all of them except Old Iron is a very interesting thing of like she left these sort of almost like ticking time bombs because we know how tentative the relationship is between humans and spirits. The fact that she never fully resolved them and sort of only just put like a, a plaster over the, the, the wounds there, they were inevitably going to fall off and that's when uh, Karuk had to suffer for what happened. Um, I think it's so important for the most perfect avatar to clarify her mistakes as well. Um, and I think for Kyoshi as well to get this lesson at the end from Yang Chen that, you know, Karuk, the avatar you thought was the worst one ever, was actually this like secret hero who like saved the world so many times, but never told anyone about it and used his own bad reputation to sort of protect Yang Chen's. And then Yang Chen, the perfect avatar, was great when it came to human versus human conflict, but actually struggled to fix issues between humans and spirits. And um, that's very interesting and it helps to clarify that all of the avatars have their flaws and strengths and so on. But uh, what were your thoughts on, on this reveal with Yang Chen? Yeah, I mean, it just, you know, goes to illustrate that no one or even the avatar is not perfect. Um, you know, there's still, you know, even if they do have, you know, the power of a, a spirit inside of them, you know, they're still human at their core and they still have to wrestle with the decisions like everyone else. It's just that 
their decisions, you know, make more of a difference on the world and, you know, generations and years to come. Um, so, you know, Kyoshi finally gets to hear this. And even if she doesn't, you know, quite understand it at this point, it's, you know, it gives her perspective, I guess, more on, you know, just sort of being an avatar in general. Um, you know, it's not, there's no clear cut way of doing it. And, you know, maybe this is just because she's, you know, still relatively young at this point that she still thinks that there is like a good way or the best way or the perfect way of doing things if you're, you know, in the right sort of situations. But this just illustrates the points that, you know, even the avatar who was thought to be the best, um, isn't necessarily the best or they're only the best on as far as like the perspective of the humans, like the spirits, you know, have a lot more sort of grievances with her. Um, but you know, none of the humans would ever know that of course. Yeah. And, and, and especially with Yang Chen and Kuruk, it's like, what is public knowledge and what isn't that Nyata and Kuruk did what they did completely behind the scenes and no one ever knew about it really. Um, and Yang Chen, obviously did all those things but they those deals wouldn't fall apart until well after her era and not everyone would make the connection that they're all happening uh, in relation to what Yang Chen being involved in the past but yeah her, her her advice to Kiyoshi is this there's a thousand generations of past lives in the avatar cycle you could spend a thousand years talking to us and you still wouldn't know how to best guide the world this is what you must forego, Kiyoshi, the easy answers. You must give up your desire for someone to tell you your choices were correct in the end. And Kiyoshi's like, I don't fully understand, but you'll keep trying anyway. That's the spirit, Kiyoshi. Um, and then the final thing is just, you broke one of the uh, air temple relics, a clay turtle. Fix it, replace it. And that fits exactly that a previous avatar made it. It was their toy. Kyoshi can replace it and it can still be the avatar relic just now this is the replacement one that Kyoshi made so that's nice uh, and that's when Yang Chen makes her exit and the chapter ends with just uh, the the note of like it's what she's doing physically but also metaphorically I suppose going forward still she uh, she still had to be careful not to lose her balance and fall Kyoshi kept her eyes focused on the difficult path sometimes stumbling but making sure to catch herself taking one step at a time so um, that advice of basically the job is impossible to do perfectly. The avatar is not something that you can just be immediately amazing at. Like it's keeping balance between humans, keeping balance between the two worlds. Even though there's a thousand people you can directly communicate with, no one has all the answers to every specific situation. It's always going to be difficult. And so just avoid the easy answers and you should be good going forward that's the the best advice she can be given and it's just her realizing that it is going to be a difficult path but when she keeps going despite the stumbles that's the best way to to, to do things um similar style of advice to yang chen's advice to ang in escape from the spirit world of just that every avatar makes their mistakes the reason they're a human is that you can connect to other humans if you too are able to make mistakes. That way you can be compassionate to people, which is like Korra's big understanding by the end of Legend of Korra. Um, but um, what are your thoughts just on the, the end of this chapter? And like, obviously next chapter is the epilogue, but for the most part, this being this key learning for Kiyoshi right at the end of the book here, that the job is just a difficult one. Just do your best, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that can really be taken to heart in any sort of situation. You really can only do as good as you can, you know, foreseeably, you know, actually do. And, you know, your choices are something that you have to figure out how you're going to live with and, you know, sort of like take it step by step as she mentions when she's following, you know, the, the spirit fox um, out of the, the area. Mm -hmm. uh, last chapter is called Epilogue. It's the epilogue to the book. So we cut to Fire Lord Zoryu, and he's basically planning to defy Kyoshi. He's go going to go against their deal. He does want to kill the imposter Yoon. He does want to kill the whole Sawan clan, just so they're, they're not a nuisance to him anymore. And the big thing he settled on at this point in time is that he needs to make it so that the clans are never this big of a threat 
to the Fire Lord or the nation itself anymore. So if the clans act out, he's going to be over the top. He's going to take them out. And the Sawan will be the first big example of that. He'll wipe them out. Then no other clans are ever going to stand up again. And his hope is just that one day a Fire Lord can sit on the throne without ever needing to worry about clan issues causing upheaval within the nation. Basically the way things are during like Sozin and everyone after that's reign. Um, so it's, it's a very, very interesting one here. But suddenly, just as he's about to sort of almost like send the order to have everyone killed, Lao Ge appears in the window of uh, Zoryu's room here. And they just have this talk here. He introduces himself. I'm Lao Ge or Tiguai. And he just notes that, uh, you know, Kiyoshi likes people to stay alive. Uh, that Kiyoshi had a hunch that Zoryu would probably go against her on this one. So Lao Ge is here to help him remember what they talked about. Um, and he just says, uh, now me, I approve of uh, your sort of ruthlessness, but my friend has a softer heart. Not a whole lot softer, mind you, she but she prefers it when people live. And Zoryu's like, she's sending an assassin after me now? I'm the Fire Lord, you know. Is this how the Avatar conducts diplomacy now? And Lao Ge's response is just, uh, you don't understand. She told me to tell you uh, she realizes her entire mistake was trying to dabble in politics with you. My friend is not a diplomat. She is the failure of diplomacy. She is the breakdown of negotiations. There is no escalation of hostilities beyond her. Um, and this is when Lao Ge decides to leave. Um, he, he, just, he also says... Um, some people in my country like to believe Avatar Yang Chen watches over them, but Fire Lord, I can assure you, Avatar Kiyoshi watches over you. Uh, Zoryu still tries to be defiant and says, she can't watch me forever, but uh, Lao Ge just says here, um, the old man tilted his head back and laughed to rival the thunder. And that's the end of the book, with the implication, of course, being that Kiyoshi can, in fact, watch him forever because she knows how to live forever because this is the guy who directly thought her that technique so um this is uh, it is a setup into the future of this is this generational project from zoryu this is something he knows he won't accomplish in his own lifetime but it will have to be the fire lord after him or the one after that that will bring his plan of the fire lord is the one entirely in control no debates and obviously the idea here is that Kyoshi manages to hold this off for quite a while, but it seemingly stops once she does in fact die. Because Sozin, of course, enacts his plans with no opposition when Roku's in, in charge as the Avatar. So um, it's, it's a decent setup going forward without being the full explanation. But, you know, it's a fun ending to the book here, even though it is our only Lauga moment in the whole book but uh, Greg what are your thoughts on the epilogue yeah I thought this was pretty cool just the uh, fact that he's coming out of nowhere threatening the, the fire lord with this sort of like ultimatum that you know the fire lord doesn't really understand you know the lengths that Kyoshi is willing or able to go to to sort of like hold up the agreement of him you know not sort of wiping out the clans and i don't know it makes me wonder you know how exactly they went about it because i think you know there could be ways to sort of like decentralize the power without potentially like taking out you know the leaders of all the other clans maybe that's sort of the route that they went through um but you know for you know whatever you know i guess grander ideas that the fire nation had of like sort of like you know taking over the whole sort of like world and whatnot that definitely was kept at bay by kiyoshi sort of being around um up until the future so it's definitely a nice little tidbit to sort of you know speak to what we know of that happens in the future um without you know putting too much into mm. it yeah I, I think that's where this final chapter does really work is that you see that this is kiyoshi pretty much as we later know her to be in terms of how she interacts with world leaders and her approach as the avatar is that no i'm not going to mess around with the subtleties of politics and be your ally and allow all this stuff to build up and happen no 
if I sense you're doing something wrong, I'm going to step in and basically force you to be better. That's the that's how Kyoshi gets results, and that's what she's doing here. That her her threat is that she's a physical threat to anyone she wants to go up against, and she's using that against people here, and using her uh, relationship with Lao Ge against people as well. That here's this like ancient assassin as well who can send the messages for her if she herself isn't uh, threatening enough, and um. I, I just like that implication that a hundred years after this chapter, she probably appears before the Fire Lord, like two or three Fire Lords from now, and says the exact same thing. Um, and I, I, I like that sort of implication that, like, Sozin's, like, grandfather or something like that, Kiyoshi sent the same message to at some point, or, or, or something like that. There, There's that implication here, and... This really fits especially the way she deals with the uh, 46th Earth King in Escape from the Spirit World with the peasant uprising in Ba Sing Se of like when he calls her to, you know, uh, make some move basically to fix things in Ba Sing Se, he threatens her and, and she just counters that by like, yep, I, I've taken out all your people, we're going to make a compromise, this is what's going to happen and she forces him to make a deal in what happens. Of course, there's mistakes there, she makes the Dai Li, but she immediately was not going to be under the <laughs> the foot of uh, the Earth King. She's the Avatar, she's an equal, basically, when she talks to these people, and I like that this is, you know, directly seeing that stuff as well. Um, I suppose the final thing with this is just that I, I did find it interesting that there was no jump a long way into the future to cover Kyoshi at like any other point in her life. I think it was pretty clear in the build up to this book that it wasn't going to cover everything with Kyoshi. But the I was a little disappointed I think perhaps that they didn't even do anything like a an extra epilogue where we jumped to like 200 year old Kyoshi and we just got a sense for okay th this is a key part in her early time as the Avatar the bits we saw during ATLA and so on were like the general hits throughout her life. But what is this character like more towards the end? And that there is still mysteries there in that the whole Lao Ge thing is implied that she could have stayed alive as long as she wanted to because Lao Ge is implied to be like thousands of years old, not just hundreds. So why did Kyoshi stop basically at 230? Why didn't she live longer? Why was it that exact age? That there's still these questions that this book gave information about but didn't fully commit to that I would have liked to have seen. Um, in addition to stuff like, you know, now the whole Coco thing still is out there as this one really weird piece of information that doesn't quite fit what we have so far. But I'm not too annoyed by it. There's definitely room to come back to Kyoshi stories at some point. I think everyone would like that. But um, it was it's a it's a solid enough ending to the book. With I think my only major criticism being that I I basically see it almost like as a dropped plot point that they don't address Rangi being upset at Kyoshi for going to kidnap people earlier on in the book, and it's just off screen resolved. That's my only major like criticism of something that's like it's kind of poorly written that that isn't addressed. But, uh, Greg, what are your thoughts, uh, final thoughts on the book, I suppose, final uh, opinions now that we're here at the end? Yeah, I mean, overall, I've really, I've really enjoyed it. Other than, like you said, that one major, that one part um, with Rangi, I don't think there's much more from what they've decided to include in this story that I would have really, you know, wanted more of. I think they covered, you know, her coming into her full sort of, like, beginning part of her avatar hood um throughout these you know these through these two books um i think that was done pretty well there's definitely like you mentioned there is a lot more to her story um that can be told um i don't know if it would have been worth it to have it in this one as sort of like an extra extra epilogue i mean i think that definitely would have been cool and everyone would appreciate it um but i think that would have just led people to even more wanting um you know, like another book, because it seems like then you actually you already have like that story, you know, pre-set up. 
Um, but, you know, if they ever did return to it in the future, I think that would definitely be something cool to have. Um, there's there's definitely plenty of stories, even if they pick a part, you know, a point in the story where it's something that we don't know anything about, um, you know, as far as like characters or, you know, specific, you know, conflicts with, you know, future Earth Kings and stuff like that. Um, I think there's like, you no know, points in there in between that they could pick something and, you know, it wouldn't have enough of a bearing for us to like, try to nitpick it with other parts even though people will regardless of course um but no overall i, I really enjoyed it mm -hmm. and uh yeah like it, i think the most obvious story if they were to do another book is to just really heavily flesh out the chin the conqueror stuff um with regards to like we saw chin village in the first book right at the end and that there is this clan of chin the culture is the same as we saw it in uh, avatar day they just have to address like why does Chin rise up in the first place? The situation surrounding that. And I think the most obvious question that arises from the Avatar Day stuff with Kiyoshi is why does she stand back and let him take over basically the entire Earth Kingdom except Ba Sing Se and Yukoya? What? Why does she stop at that point basically? Oh, She only stops him when he comes after Yukoya. And I think that needs a bit of explanation. Um, as well as just characterizing Chin better, because Avatar Day still borderline treats it as a little bit comedic, that scene. And then also cover the 40, 46th Earth King, which is pretty heavily related to that, I think. And Kyoshi's dynamic with the 46th Earth King is probably the reason she allows Chin to do as much as he does. Um, but that's just something I'd like to see coming up next. But uh, otherwise... That is the end of The Shadow of Kyoshi and the end for now, it seems like, of the novels. It was this two book deal. We've now got both of those bo those books. And in my opinion, like from what I've seen, everyone who's read them has loved them and wants to see more novels. That this format for Avatar works perfectly and it's something I think we need going forward is something that can offer us this level of depth with regards to world building places and the ability to make all these connections uh i think they should definitely look into doing much more of these novels not just about kiyoshi but about other topics i think there's so much that could be done especially given that they seem to be able to do things with a little bit of an extra sort of mature level in this even compared to Korra in the novels so that's another reason why i really want it so I hope sooner rather than later we get the next novels confirmed, regardless of what exactly the topic is. I just, I think novel format now sort of has to be this thing that we get a little bit more regularly going forward. Um, and I suppose that's kind of the final topic here, Greg. Um, what do you think after this successful first two novel series, the future of the novel format is for Avatar? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's really, there is so much that they could do now that we've seen that this this format definitely works and is, you know, I would say for most people is uh, a success. I mean, you know, they also have the audio books of them, which I think, you know, a lot of people have enjoyed just as much. Um, so that gives you just another way for it to work. But I guess as far as stories, I mean, I think, you know, any of the stories that we've considered, you know, as far as like being like the graphic novel format, I think it's something that can be transplanted to this format as well, or even any sort of like minor stories. I think a lot of the the history of the Avatar world, maybe that might actually be more interesting in novel form rather than in a more uh, visual form, just because of the amount of uh, information. So the whole sort of like lore aspect that might be more intriguing to have in this format um, rather than, you know, another format, but, you know, that or any of those sort of, like, typical character stories that we're always sort of talking about, like Ivro or anything like that, or even more of the, like, the history of the Fire Nation. I think the little bits that we got of that in these two novels um, was really interesting just to hear sort of, like, the origins. So that could be another avenue um, as far as, like, getting more information and, you know, you can wrap that along with, you know, any of the other previous avatars that we don't know of or that were sort of like slightly mentioned in this book um which you know seemed to get a lot of interest i think um from the fandom in general even if we know 
absolutely nothing about any of the characters per se. I've seen a lot of stuff on people sort of putting forth their own sort of theories on the previous sort of avatars now that we have like their names or just like more images of people like, you know, naming just like, you know, that one image we have of like the past avatars. Um, so that might be something that could be more explored now and it, you know, might not have any bearing on anything that we currently know. So it's a lot safer to play with since, you know, we're always sort of like, worrying about what's going to you know, affect the current storyline and what fits in where. So that might be, I don't know, avenue that could be taken without, you know, ruining, you know, the avatar lore of the future or mm -hmm. whatever. And yeah, I, I definitely think they need to continue to do more novels because in a way the novels have been like the key thing, like the last two years, that if you took them away, the comics have been a little bit of a disappointment, I think, the last two years. And especially going into like next year that like we're on one shot comics now for atla which i know a lot of people aren't particularly happy about even if they're you know going to be interested and excited when they come out the fact that they're taking a step away from doing the comic continuation story is not something people are happy with we're very much you know waiting desperately waiting for the next core comic announcement and we don't know what direction they're going to take they could also go into one shots and stop the continuation after runes of the empire so if 2021 comes around and there's no novel there's no direct continuation to runes of the empire or imbalance you know kind of, what, what are we doing and, and that's where if they do announce more novels kind of regardless of what they're about i think there's going to be a lot of hype behind them just because they worked so well with the first two but um yeah that, other than that that has been the podcast for this week uh obviously we'll review the new comics and stuff like that when they come out um the katara comic is obviously the next new comic that's out in october we'll review that when it comes out uh, in terms of shows that we have planned before then i think we have to get around to doing a sort of re-review of turf wars um I don't know if we'll do a re-review -re of Runes of, the uh, Runes of the Empire anytime soon, but Turf Wars for sure, we, we, we definitely want to get back around to uh, covering that. So that might actually be the next podcast, but um, we'll, we'll wait and see on that. Um, but yeah, it's been myself and Greg. Thanks for listening to this podcast, and bye. Bye-bye.